Hello and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. We are so glad that you're here and we are so glad to have our first live studio audience here with us. Really 50 quiet people, 50 <laughs> excited, oh good, now we can hear them, 50 excited gardeners and we're really glad they're here. Hi, I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department. So I'll answer if there's any questions, I'll maybe cover some cut flowers or perennial questions. But we're going to do lots of um, questions that are from the live studio audience. And we're going to start with the guy on the end. And who's here? Shane Coulter. Hi, Shane. Hi, Diane. I'm Shane Coulter. I'm one of the family owners of Country Arbors Nursery and Coulter Nurseries in Urbana, Illinois, and Onarg, Illinois. And we're celebrating our 150th anniversary of being in the nursery industry. So it's kind of a big year for us. We do perennials, annuals, trees, shrubs, and I answer a little bit on all of those. So uh, if you gear those questions, I might be able to help you on those. And I've got a question okay. to lead the day here. And the question is, what is the best way to mulch underneath my grapes? And would newspaper and mulch be a good choice? And I'll start off by saying that mulch is a fantastic product. Just across the board, it does such a great job of you know, keeping moisture in, keeping weeds down, it decomposes into good soil. And I will also follow that with weed fabric underneath mulch defeats the purpose because mulch breaks down into soil. So when you put weed fabric with mulch on top, you will have dirt on top of weed fabric and dirt on top of weed fabric gets weeds. So if you're gonna mulch and under grapes or anything, newspaper and you wanna put some kind of weed fabric, cardboard, newspaper, all that underneath the mulch, gives you one extra layer of protection to keep the weeds up and the moisture in. So lay that extra cardboard down, lay the extra newspaper down, mulch right on top of it, and you'll have good weed prevention, good moisture uh, holding, and we'll do a great job for keeping that all in check. The one and only time I used weed fabric, it seems like the weeds go through and the roots get caught underneath They're and then you can't pull. pull them out. If it you're gonna was... use rock or something, that, that, that's very helpful because the seeds and everything will grow through the rock. That's a purpose, perfect time for weed fabric. But when it comes to mulch or anything, yeah, it, just keep it mm -hmm. away. Put a nice three inches, two to three inches of mulch, and you should not have any weed problems. And the ones you do will be much easier to pull than if you had weed fabric. And what is a mulch vo volcano? A mulch should volcano is very common. Against a tree, everybody likes to mulch their trees as they should, <laughs> but they mound it up. And you'll see it's so high, it's almost at the first branch. <laughs> It's so tall, but yeah, let's uh, let's get it up and let's get it down. Okay, no, no mulch vo volcanoes. No mulch volcano. Okay, thank you, Shane. Thank and you. now let's go to the lady in the middle, Teresa Mears. Hi, I'm Teresa Mears. I'm an instructor at Parkland College, and I teach horticulture and plant ID, uh, turf grass, greenhouse production, interior plants, kind of my specialties. Mm -hmm. And I thought since they are in just outstanding bloom everywhere, in fact, this building is pretty much wrapped in these guys, but this is the tree lilac, Syringa reticulata. Most likely it's the ivory silk cultivar that is so popular. And it is just an outstanding plant. This has been a fabulous year for it. Um, and it's got the same fragrance as some of the shorter lilacs, the traditional purples and pinks and blues or bluish colors, but it, uh, I mean, it's actually strong smelling up here. But what's interesting yet after this, after all the flowers fade out and the seed pods form, they actually leave an ornamental appearance as well. And they'll rattle in the wind and be quite ornamental as well. It's just a fabulous plant. It's a street tree in a lot of places. And like Shane said earlier to me, if it's been used as a street tree, it's a pretty dependable, pretty reliable plant and you're gonna have good luck usually with it. And I looked it up, it was zone three to seven. Mm -hmm. Very hardy. And an important thing is it doesn't get all that tall. 20 feet at 20 most. So, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's one outside that's probably a little older and a little larger, but like all things, it can be checked a little bit, but that's a great size. There's yes. just not a lot of stuff mm -hmm. that's hardy and beautiful and you know, strong at that height. Just outstanding. It smells great, but not overpowering. Mm -hmm. No, that's Very the first thing nice. people say, oh, I don't want it as much as a t you know, the 10 foot common lilac. It's yeah. not that strong, but no. it ha you know, it's nice. It's subtle. It means, and they don't it know means any spring. insects that attack it. Yeah. There you go. It's yeah. unanimous. Yep. It it's just a great means tree. Here. <laughs> it's really good. In the summer, that's what you get. Well, thanks for bringing that because we were chatting about it mm -hmm. earlier. Okay. Well, I'm going to go next to you, Dr. Jim <laughs> Appleby, AKA Dr. Pest. Dr. Pest, yes. Of the month. 
<laughs> well, I'm an entomologist here at the University of Illinois, so I deal with the insects and mites attacking trees and shrubs and flowers. And uh, I brought a couple things in today. Uh, I suppose everybody's wondering, well, why in the world would he bring a hat in? Well, you know, Diane, I have a lot of insect friends. Yes, you do. Some of them are actually too friendly. Uh, oh, yes. And I think probably a lot of your gardeners are out in, the, in your garden and you're bothered with these very friendly flies that come flying around your face. They get into your eyes, they get into your nostrils and in your ears. They're actually called um, eye gnats. Mm. And they can be very bothersome. So I mentioned this to a, a fellow entomologist of mine, uh, Bob, Dr. Bob Novak, and he said, well, Jim, use bounce. Use, you know, the fabric, uh, what do they call it, fabric? Uh, um, Softener, softener, softener squares, fabric yeah. softener that you use in your dryer. And look and, how uh, stylish that is. Put, <laughs> <laughs> wow. put that on your hat and, you know, maybe let an inch or two uh, down in the front. And I tell you, it really works. They do not come around you. And I don't be bothered by mosquitoes either. So it's really a, a neat little job. Now, you can, uh, and I think all of us should wear big hats like this to prevent sun. And I think these you know, baseball caps are not going to work because you're, you're exposing the ear. So we all should wear large hats like this. And uh, I wear a white long sleeve shirt because mm -hmm. insects are not attracted to white. So that really helps. And uh, But I think you're really going to like this uh, idea wearing, I, I wear a, a bounce on the back end. Of my it's dashing. <laughs> it's very dashing. I figured you'd say it was Safari dashing. Safari looking. <laughs> Anyway, try that and maybe let Diane know to see yeah. how you like that idea. Well, I'm going to try that. It has to be that brand, too. Well, I don't know. That's what Bob told me. Okay. And we don't have stock in the company. So okay. All right. That's what I needed to know. And the only other thing I want you to mention, because uh, everybody's interested in bagworms, and as you see here, uh, you, you uh, radio listeners don't, won't be able to see this, but bagworms are, look like little bags on, the, on evergreens. They can be very, very, very destructive. Well, those eggs are now hatching in the central part of the Midwest, and they're very, very tiny. Uh, actually, uh, you can see a couple of them here, right here. They look like little cones, and uh, they overwinter in the egg stage, and then the eggs hatch, and then the young go out onto these uh, new shoots and start feeding. So if, if you're having a problem with uh, bagworms, or if you see bagworms on a branch right now, I would highly recommend that you use the insecticide Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a bacterial insecticide and you'll get good control. You can apply that up until about uh, the middle of August, but by that time they're really getting large and they're causing a lot of destruction. So think about that if you're in the middle part of the Midwest here, uh, now would be a good time to spray or within the next uh, three weeks. But you don't want to let them go too long or they cause a lot of injury. You know, we get yeah. so many questions about bagworms. I'm yeah, glad you I mean, covered yeah. that. That's the key. Alert. Now is the time yeah. to mm -hmm. spray for bagworms. BT, thuricide, yeah. that's what you're looking yeah. for. Very good. Thank you so much. Well, we had one of our live studio audience members bring in uh, some kumquats, and we had talked about it one other show, how you get them at just certain times of the year, and you can't have them year-round. Well, Alice uh, gave us the hint of freezing them, and bringing them out year round whenever you wanted to have them. So they're really good and we you pop the whole thing in and I'll do that after the show. But anyway, they're really good that way and they can also be dipped in chocolate. And so some fruits of the spring are these beautiful strawberries and they have been dipped in chocolate and there's a secret ingredient and it's just dark chocolate and avocado. Really? That's the secret. No sugar, no cream. And they, not that I know this, but they're delicious because there were four yeah. and now there are just three. So I might share them with other people, but you could dop, uh, dip the, uh, the kumquat in the same mix. So just that's so attractive. So thank you. And we had talked about kumquats. All right. Well, let's go back to you, Shane. All right. So I've got the next question. And it is a question about our favorite weed, the dandelion. <laughs> and they're asking, can I put dandelions in my compost and will the seeds die? You know, I had to ask around a little bit and see what other people think. The, the dandelion itself, the, the foliage and the green, that should be of no issue. If you put that in a nice compost and get it hot enough, I think that that will be completely fine. If it has gone to seed and gets the big seed head, 
seeds are very hard to kill and the heat I don't think will absolutely kill the seed it will stay with you and when you spread the compost I think you're gonna have dandelion so just try and, and pull them and get them up before they go to seed uh, and if my neighbors are listening, that's a good idea <laughs> to get those because uh, they have not listened to that. But yeah, I would say get them up, compost them, don't let them go to seed. If they're still just in the flower stage, in the yellow yeah, stage, you exactly. don't have mature seed. So you could still get rid of them that way. But the seed stage, yeah. If you can blow it away, it's it, too late. It's too late. And if it's a little farther along than the yellow, it will actually develop if it's closed yeah. it will develop but you just yes. have to be a little careful there. it's just hard to get a compost pile to get that hot yeah yeah and i don't think and there's seeds, any as heat. we know seeds will pass through everything and oh, you know, they're they're the they're, they're made to survive mm -hmm. yeah. so the compost won't do anything i guess any we need to start having spring tonic and eat the dandelion greens and <laughs> exactly. stems and flowers a good thick lawn will keep it a lot of those That's out of right. a healthy lawn will prevent all the weeds god fills holes don't let there be any holes Mm -hmm. Okay, but dandelions yeah. find those holes, that's, that's for sure. True. That's <laughs> okay, thank you. And now, Teresa. I have a question about um, sprouting potatoes or onions that were in the pantry. Okay, can I put them in my garden now? Well, your onion or your potato that is there that's starting to sprout, they are, in the case of the onion, it's a bulb. In the case of the potato, it's a tuber. These are structures that are storage units for the plant. And their job is to make energy to get new plants to grow. So when they're starting to do this, they are degrading the potato in your pantry and the onion in your pantry. You can plant them out. They will not have the full amount of energy because they've been using some of their energy, having no roots, having nothing there to help supply and replace that energy. Um, but that's how we make new plants all the time is we're always taking parts and pieces and making new ones. So yeah, you can plant them out. Um, they're just going to be a smaller plant and not as big, but you also could, um, like in the case of potatoes, if you take off those eyes, you can still eat them. They're, they're not as good as a fresh potato, but they are just breaking down the sugars that are in your plant there and taking I, energy. I had three that sprouted and mm -hmm. I have five that look normal mm -hmm. and I have one that's a half inch tall plant. Yeah. And the other ones are six, eight, yeah, nine They inches. just don't have the same energy. They didn't have the root establishment. so. But it's an experiment. It's, it's, it's a horticultural experiment. It's great fun with kids. Potato bones out. Yeah, it is a mm -hmm. lot of fun with kids to do that and show that this is where we started and this is their end product then. So notes to self, mm -hmm. anything that you're not sure is going to work, it's a horticultural experiment. That's right. So that's, that's it's your... It's a teaching moment. A teaching... Oh, I love that one. Teaching <laughs> moment. Very good. Thank you, Teresa. Now, Jim, what have you got for us? Well, we have a question here. It says, when is the proper time to treat ash tree for ash borer? I mean, what date? And that was a question from Barb. Um, the best treatments for uh, emerald ash borer to control it are uh, two, two uh, different chemicals. The one is called triage. It's spelled T-R-E-E dash A-G-E. And uh, that chemical is, is not available to the average homeowner. You have to have a, uh, a certified arborist apply it. But it's by far the most effective. Uh, it will last in a tree for three years. Wow. So, you know, it's probably well worth it to hire somebody like that and have that applied. That's by far the most effective. The one that's available to the homeowner is made by Bayer. It's called Tree and Shrub Insect Control, and that contains a chemical called Emdichloroprid. Now, it can be applied, when you apply this, uh, I would say sometime, probably May and June would be the best time. I would think go more for early May, but it could be applied at this time of year in June or maybe even as late as July, but that will only last one year, so you have to do this every year, whereas uh, triage, that that too is probably best applied in, in May and June, but it will last three years. So those are the two materials that should be used, but you know, emerald ash borer is a terrible insect and it's, it's continuing to increase uh, its range. If you're interested in uh, learning more about the emerald ash borer, we do have a publication here at the University of Illinois. I have to give this a little bit publicity. Yes, you do. And uh, it's called How to Diagnose, Detect, and Search for Infestations of the Emerald Ash Borer. It's well illustrated by many, many pictures, and it actually even shows some of the insects back here that are not emerald ash borer that I get a lot of questions mm -hmm. about. 
You can obtain this by calling our main office, and that main office number is area code 217-333-2770. And when you uh, call that number, just say that you'd like to get a, this leaflet on Emerald Ash Borer. Unfortunately, we have to charge $2 for this publication because uh, it is expensive to reproduce in color. So mm -hmm. it's $2, but when you call, give the person your name and send in a check for $2. Pebbles, the University of Illinois, and we'll send this out to you. I find the, the insects that look like it, it's, that's very good to know. Yeah, it is. What you is know, not particularly right at this season, you know that the p two little ones that get most uh, crushed are the tiger beetle that's bright green. Mm -hmm. There's another insect that's a little uh, greenish too. That, so, and you know, the tiger beetle is is really important insect predator, so it shouldn't be stepped on. And it shows a very nice picture of that, right? Back here. They're beautiful. They're beautiful. I saw one yesterday. And they're you know, very so, common. So it's not Jim emerald. Gets, Jim gets pretty excited about that. It's beautiful. I know. But it's well, metallic beautiful. green, they really Shane. Are. It's beautiful. The colors. The colors. <laughs> they really are. I it's love pretty it. enough that I notice I it. I love so. it. Yeah. There are some really good insects out there. Oh, yes. yeah. Most of them are, yeah. actually. So watch out for caterpillars, generic <laughs> caterpillars. Okay. Well, Shane, let's go and see what you have next for All us. All right. We have another question. Uh, it's about ornamental grasses. The question is, there are several ornamental grasses that have died this past winter in our community. Could this have happened because of the lawn company that cut them down before winter, or is there some other reason they didn't make it? And I will defend, I, we don't have a lawn company, but I will say the lawn companies get blamed for everything. If a window is broken, the lawn company did it. If the, <laughs> if the house paint fades, it's a lawn company. Lawn companies get blamed for a lot of stuff. But that being said, they often... The people doing the lawns aren't as, as uh, educated as they probably should be. They've been told what to do. And when it comes to ornamental grasses, the best thing is to not cut them down going into winter. That grass holds in, catches leaves, catches everything in the wind, and protects them for the winter. Gives them just a little bit more insulation that they wouldn't have uh, during the season. So cutting them down does expose the grass. So it gives you a much higher chance of losing your ornamental grasses if you cut them down. The other thing is planting ornamental grasses late. Uh, I have a conflict of interest because I'm trying to sell out my ornamental grasses at the end of the season, but the reality is you probably shouldn't plant ornamental grasses much after October because they don't get rooted in going into winter. So your penicetums and some of your grasses that are good hardy grasses, but they're much like the mums you buy in the store. You don't get them planted soon enough, it's not going to make it over the winter. So my guess is giving two hard winters in a row, uh, the ornamental grasses that were planted a little too late probably were the ones that died. So that's that's my guess. Get them in much sooner, don't cut them down, and you have a much better chance of them living. Okay, and gives us something to look at in the winter. Yeah, no, They're it's, attractive. it's a pretty, and especially most of the grasses that are sold today don't break off and blow all over the place. They keep their heads, and they're, they're really pretty. Mm -hmm. They're evergreen, if you will. You only have a three-week window where you cut them down, and it takes a little while to catch back up. But yeah, I think they're great. Really winter nice. character is winter the term. Winter character. Yeah, the snow with the grass. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I put one right by my driveway so I know where to stop plowing. <laughs> so, you know. And functional. Functional. <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> Thank you, Shane. Teresa, let's well, go to you. Uh, on that note, I'm also going to talk grasses, but okay. mine aren't ornamental. These are actually turf grasses, even though I've let them get long. Wow. But what I have, this real fine, delicate one, is a um, fine fescue. This is the only grass you try to grow in shade. And try is the mighty word. And say the name of it again. Fine fescues. Fine fescues. Fine fescues. Shade is the enemy of grass. Grass likes full sun, so we give it full sun to make it happy. But what I have here, and they are a little floppy because they've been in the greenhouse. They haven't ex been exposed to the weather and they haven't been mowed. I have a Kentucky bluegrass and I have a tall fescue. This is not the tall fescue of history. This is not the Kentucky 31. If you see Kentucky 31 tall fescue, stay away from it. We have taken that one and we have bred it and bred it and bred it to come up with colors that match, because it traditionally is more yellow green, to match our bluegrasses. Mm -hmm. We're working on the texture to make the texture match. And they've actually got it now where you can sod it because the roots met together. Mm. And the beauty of this is that it makes a much deeper root, a much more massive root. And one reason I don't have these mowed is because I wanted to show you the establishment of the roots. Amount of grass on top, 
equates the amount of grass on, or the amount of roots underneath. So if you tend to be a very shallow mower, mow an inch and a half or two inches, you don't have very good roots. You don't get through our summers. Bluegrass doesn't like heat. Kentucky, the tall fescues tolerate more heat. They have deeper roots. In the middle of July and August, if we have a very hot, dry year, our Kentucky bluegrasses will start to brown and go dormant. Our tall fescues will still look good. And I was talking with some of the uh, guys at the University of Illinois Turf Farm the other day. I took my students out there, and they were saying there are several neighborhoods in Indianapolis now, new developments, that will not let them plant bluegrass anymore. It has to be the uh, tall fescues. Interesting. And if they have turf plots out there where you can see side-by-side -side comparisons. You would not be pick out. You would not be able to tell the difference between the bluegrass and the fescues in some cases. Because it's so much finer texture and good colors. Oh, it's just amazing what, what they've you done think with of. It, what they've done. And they have the old Kentucky 31 as a comparison, so you can really see the difference. But I am definitely moving that direction in my lawn in the areas where I'm having to do some stuff because they blend right in, and then in the middle of summer they stand out a little bit, but that's okay. Because they look good. Yeah, they look good. <laughs> and most that's seeds not a bad now thing. have blended the two because they're realizing, so you're, most are 60-40 yeah. of both of but these. But be careful. I went shopping. And I won't say where, but I went shopping to try to, not your place, <laughs> went shopping to get some stuff, to get some seed. And I was having difficulty finding anything that was not the Kentucky 31. Yeah. Oh. And you don't want 31. Yeah. <laughs> That's the one to avoid. Not Kentucky 31. Yes. That's Fescue. the parent material that, that came up with this. That it, okay. it, it's a beautiful grass. It's a very good grass. It's very sustainable. It's a very good choice nowadays. Sounds great. Well, thank you for and it's, that. It's just outstanding. Seeing the roots really lets you see how mm -hmm. strong that is. So mow high. Yeah, I mow three high. and a half, four inches at my house. Yeah, we do mow high mm -hmm. as well. You guys mow? We meaning people uh -oh. at my house. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Dave. So anyway, <laughs> when mowing is done, it's mowed yeah. high. <laughs> and if you have irrigation, you know, if, you're, if people have irrigation, bluegrass can survive if you have irrigation. But if you don't, you'd need to move this way. Well, it, it, but the heat is also an enemy. Yeah, so even with true. irrigation, mm -hmm. if we have a very hot summer, true. your bluegrass still suffers. It mm -hmm. struggles. Yeah. And be okay. nice to your plants. There's for all the lawn fanatics. Thank you. You covered that very well. <laughs> all right, let's go to you, Jim. Well, there's a, we have a question here from Lynn, and she says, my knockout rose bush is already being eaten by something that I have not seen. Is there a particular insect that uh, attacks them at this time of year? And uh, she sent us some pictures, but um, I really can't tell from the photograph what insect that may be. Uh, probably if she's got a close-up camera, <laughs> you could take a better photograph of that insect. It possibly could be a sawfly. There's an insect called uh, rose sawfly that feeds um, on the undersides. And so there's mm -hmm. another species that feeds on the top side that sort of skeletonizes the leaves. Um, those are easily controlled with any of the insecticides, if, if it is that. But from what I see here, I'm, I'm afraid I can't tell what insect it might be that's on her particular right. bushes. Okay. Well, we're going to go. We've had a lot of knockout rose questions yeah. here lately, so yeah. that's maybe Have we'll they had hear more. Tough, it, it, I've had questions of roses not making it through the winter. Yes. Has it been a tough year for them? Yeah, and that's the thing mm -hmm. people always associate with just a hard cold winter is the killer and that's not always the case the fluctuation of temperatures mm -hmm. and especially late in the winter early spring is tough on on the roses especially but it's it's tough on other plants in the winter if we have just a cold all the way through winter things seem to do fine oh, yeah. snow cover protects it it's when it warms up in the day and then blasts at night that is just so damaging or 50 in january yeah 50 mm -hmm. in january and that's uh and that's what happened this past winter we were all over the board as far as temperatures and uh, it was really hard we lost a lot of plants at the nursery for the first time more than the year before that was extremely cold but there was more snow that. cover yeah. the year before well, it stayed cold and, and it, it stayed yeah. cold, it that's right. Down. And that's why I say like on a Japanese maple, it's not, it's not that it needs the protection during the winter, it needs to stay away from, from fluctuation. So keeping on the north side keeps it in that frozen zone, or putting on the south side warms it up with the sunlight and then blasts it at night and absolutely hates that. So that fluctuation is just as damaging in the winter. I recall the winter that we had really a wet winter and then it dropped 50 or 60 degrees and all of the English ivy 
yeah. died. It was a boon for the nurseries. Yeah. But nothing it, kills English ivy. It's but, been kind of a boon for the last couple of years. <laughs> I mean, something different. But We've moved the, our butterfly bush to the annual section <laughs> lately. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah. I haven't seen any of my butterfly bush. No, we talked uh, about it and said, oh, just wait. Yeah, we just shifted they'll a couple be up. feet to the left. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they'll be up. Oh, it was a rough winter. Well, I want to first thank Sarah. It's Sarah's last uh, day today, and she has been so great working with Mid-American Garden. So we want to thank her and wish her well for the rest of her life. So thank you, Sarah, very much. And we've got to thank this wonderfully beautiful live audience. Thank you so much, live audience. It has been so fun. We want to thank each of you for watching. Goodbye.